Hello, everyone. My guest today is Steven Schneider with more than 20 years of technology leadership experience. He's the CEO today of Logi Analytics. Prior to this role, he served as both CEO and CPO at Logic, where he held both sales, product, and engineering, marketing, and customer success teams. Prior to this company, he was a founding partner of On Demand IQ, a hosting business intelligence solution, and a practicing manager at leading web technology company, Proxicom. All right, Steven, are you ready to take us to the top? Let's do it. All right. What is Logi Analytics and how do you guys make money? Sure. So Logi works with application teams, typically product managers and the developers on their teams to embed dashboard reporting and analytics in their software application, typically self-service reporting, visualizations, dashboard, things along those lines. And they typically come to us because the end users of their application are demanding it. Uh, they're losing competitively, uh, so they need something to differentiate, or they need to make sure to maintain the maintenance stream of an existing product that they have, and they want to be able to get to market fast, and they want something that is better than that they can build it themselves. Okay, so I don't understand. G- give me a customer story. Uh, uh, name name the customer and tell me how they use it. Sure. MotionSoft. They make gym membership management software. They spent most of their original kind of software development effort figuring out how to make a software for managing a gym, how people walk in and check, how many people to staff, that sort of stuff. They then found from their customers that they wanted to have reporting on top of that to figure out what are their busy times, how many people should I staff at specific times, that sort of thing. Uh, They needed dashboards to show key metrics across multiple gyms for some of their customers that had multiple gyms. Uh, They may want to embed things like, uh, how do I predict if someone coming into the gym is likely to churn, for example, uh, so that they can uh, take action when that person comes in to give them a free personal training coupon or something like that. So this is all internal. It's not the gym members seeing how many times they checked into the gym, like in the consumer app. So we, we offer something to product managers that they embed in their software application. And most of those software applications are B2B software applications because businesses want to run analytics on their, on their businesses. Yeah, I get that, Stephen. I just want to be clear though. This is not, people are not buying your tool to give their consumers applications. They're buying your tool to get, make their businesses smarter internally. So we sell primarily to software companies that want to embed us in their software application that they then sell to other companies that want to improve their business. Yeah, not to cons- so not to cons- not to the gym member. That's right. So MotionSoft would sell to Curves or Gold's Gym or you know Twenty uh, Four Hour Fitness or whatever it may be, and they would deploy it across all of their locations. Got it. Okay. Without going down every customer cohort, I'm sure you have many. Well, give me a sense of what the average customer might pay per year for something like this. So it varies. Uh, I'd say on the low end, it's about a half an FTE from a developer standpoint. On the high end, it could be a team of- Well, hold on. So so actually give us numbers here because my audience won't, that I'll lose them. Yeah. Yeah. So it can range from maybe $50,000 per year up to a million dollars plus a year. It really varies on the size of the deployment. So a smaller company that is only selling to maybe 20 gyms is going to pay something on the lower end. A larger company that's deploying it across hundreds of sites across the country are going to pay a much higher. I want to know your averages, Stephen. Like, what is your the perfect kind of customer for you, and what are they paying per year? It's about a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, got it. Typical, but it can vary. Got it. So that would put it what like 30, 40 location kind of thing. Uh, well, again, it depends. So we offer to customers in a wide range of different uh, verticals and different deployments. So if you have a lot of deployments, but those deployments are very small in terms of deal size, like $1,000 a piece or $2,000 a piece, then we're going to need a lot of customers for in order for it to make financial sets. Some of our customers, for instance, we have one that sells software to sovereign wealth funds. They have 20 locations, but each of those locations, they charge millions of dollars for. Sure. So we don't really need a lot of locations. So it really varies. Got it. Okay. Put this on a timeline for us. When did you launch the company? So the company was founded in 2003, actually, and it was founded as more of an application development framework in the kind of business intelligence space, but it really didn't start growing until about 2010. Okay, so what were you doing for those seven years? I mean, was it more of an agency? Uh, it was a bootstrap company. It did not have a lot of resources to spend. So it was you know three to $5 million of revenue, working with customers that came in through the web with very small transaction sizes, five to $10,000. Okay. And in 2010, That's where we really kind of found our niche of working with application teams. So again, principally software companies, but often enterprises that look like software companies. And that's when we started growing. And now it sounds like those, the three to 5 million business you built between 03 and 2010, that was more though like a go hunt, get a project, do the project, move on to the next customer, like move a sale. It wasn't a recurring SaaS model then. Yeah. So, so, so let's talk about that for a second. So, so we are not a SaaS business. Okay, let's talk about what that means, though. We often work with companies that are SaaS companies to embed within their application, but our software is deployed. Uh, Up until about 2010, and actually really until recently, and really about the 2015 timeframe, about half of our business was perpetual. So we'd sell it, they'd package it within their software application, 
Uh, and we'd get a maintenance stream, but it was more of a perpetual model. Today, we're 95% all term contract based. Okay, but like per year or something like that? That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So by the way, why do you say that that's not, I mean, most people define SaaS as something cloud related and there's a recurring revenue stream annually and you're charging per seat, per usage, per whatever. Why do you say you're not a SaaS company? Well, so to me, the definition of SaaS is software as a service, right? And we don't host anything. We don't have any DevOps. We have nothing hosted on our own internal cloud that we manage. Uh -huh. um, we, we have software that we ship. They deploy it within their cloud environment, but we're not actually managing anything. But they have to um, keep coming back to you every year. It's not like they can keep doing it every year without you. They have to come back and keep what, renewing the license or something? Uh, typically, if they want to keep distributing it, they would keep renewing the license. That and why right. do they have to do that if they own it? Um, well, so for, again, it the way we structure our licenses is to allow them to deploy it to new customers. So as long as the business is healthy and they're still getting new customers or they're still wanting to deploy new upgrades and things along those lines, they'll keep coming back to us. Do you make, it, do you make any money? If you, so if you deploy part A and they're using that for a year and they keep just using part A in years two, threes, and four, you're saying they don't pay you for two, three, and four unless they add a part B in part two, three, and four? So every contract we map back to their business model. It's not like a traditional transactional software application where here's the price and this is how we price it. We first have to say, how do you license your software? Is it per user, per site, per additional person? Is it term or perpetual? And then we have a model that maps back to their model. So it really comes back to how do they sell their software is how we will ultimately continue to generate revenue. Okay, interesting. Um, okay, so 2003 really got things going in 2010 and then fast forward today. So Bootstrap or Race Capital? So we raised venture capital in, I think, uh, well, our first round, Series A, small round was in 2008. We did additional rounds in 2010, 2013, but we were actually acquired by a private equity firm last year. Uh, actually, one year anniversary was on Friday. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so it's, but okay, so it's, let's keep talking about before that acquisition. So pre-acquisition, total raise in the company was how much? About 50 million. Okay, five zero, uh, 50 million bucks there. And then you sold in 26, uh, 2017. So take us through that story, why, why sell? Well, so the company had gotten to a, a point where we had we had grown a decent amount um, and we had started to bake the track towards profitability in 2017. And it just made sense for us to get new investors that were more aligned to kind of how we intended to grow in the future. Uh, a lot of our earlier investors were venture investors. Uh, and as you probably know, when you're talking to a lot of, of VC oriented companies, those companies are about grow, 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 grow um, up into a certain point. It's more of a roulette wheel type model. Uh, we were at the point now we had grown to a certain amount. Our growth had frankly slowed down a little bit and we were oriented to profitability and we wanted to just start growing in a different path. Also, we saw an opportunity to potentially do M&A in the future to grow faster and new investors made sense for us at that point. Yeah, uh, just because, I mean, private equity, obviously, they might not be looking at growth, 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 but they're looking at cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, right? So wa walk me through the, the private equity firm that came in and bought you guys. I assume they took, you know, usually they're taking a majority stake or buying 100% of the company. Did they buy the whole company? They bought the whole company. We're 100% okay. owned now. But that's right. Okay. So, w w you know, I'm asking this and you'll laugh, but I mean, so why are you still there? It's hard to motivate someone once they're, once they're wealthy. Uh, well, so, so first off, um, I, you know, I come to work every day, not necessarily for that reason. I, I come to work to build things and grow things. And, and like any other, like a private equity firm coming in is really just a, another investor, right? So, so when you talk to a private equity firm, you establish what is the story? What is your growth path? How are you going to grow the company? And, and we firmly believe here at Logi, and I believe that there's this new evolution of a product stack emerging. I mean, if you think about 10 years ago, we sold uh, marketing was uh, maybe 15 years ago. Marketing was uh, trade shows and collateral. Now there's a whole industry that sells to marketing around marketing automation and marketing technology and lead optimization. Uh, I believe that product managers, which frankly didn't exist 20 years ago, is, is a new industry that's emerging. And people nowadays aren't going to build products completely from scratch. They're going to go out and get best of breed components to get to market faster and assemble those those things into a modern product stack that they deliver. You saw it happen in infrastructure. You know, I, I agree with that. The I, I can totally agree with that thesis. I mean, this is why SaaS is taking off. Well, and, and we believe that our next evolution is to go after that space. And we needed, frankly, a partner with bigger pockets that could help us assemble that product stack faster. Yeah. Um, so that's the vision. I'm here still here and executing. And this was Marlin, by the way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, interesting. Okay. Very good. So uh, give me a breakdown team size. So where does that say in terms of total team? Yeah, we're about 140 employees. Uh, we have a team in the, a small team in the Ukraine and a small team in the uh, UK and Ireland. And then the rest? Are yeah. Here in DC. D okay. DC, Northern Virginia area.
Tyson's Corner. Close Tyson's enough. Corner. Yeah, yeah. I know. I do the same thing. There, are people go, "Where are you from?" I say, "DC," but you know, Leesburg, close enough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, very well, good. I don't know if I'd give you that one. But okay. <laughs> hey, listen, the metro is the metro going out there yet? Yeah, if the metro reaches there, or a train reaches there from DC, then I call it DC. You know. That's right. Well, it goes to, <laughs> not quite to Dallas Airport, but it'll get there eventually. There you go. All right, very good. So, um, good. Sold it last year, and then walk me through today. So you, um, oh, sorry, pre, uh, pre, uh, pre sale. You said you raised fifty million bucks. You said one of the reasons you sold is because you really would look at potentially acquisitions for growing. Have you done any acquisitions to date? Uh, we have not yet. Okay. Uh, we have not. But, but again, you know, we're focused right now on both organic growth and looking at inorganic growth options. Um, but you know, inorganic growth is, is hard to hard to time, right? So it's it's about getting to the right place from an organization to where we can support that inorganic growth. And I firmly believe we'll get there. Uh, but no, we have not done any that day today. Yeah. And from 2010, when you really started ramping things up to today, walk us through how many customers you've scaled to. Whew. So so if you go back to the inception of the company, we brought on about 1,900 customers. Um, so so quite a few. Um, we're you know from a revenue standpoint, we're mid 30s, just to okay. give you some kind of yeah, idea, yeah. millions of revenue. And that's ARR. Um, uh, well, actually, both. So, so both revenue and AR are going to be start with a three. That's exactly right, um, and that's where we are today. Um, and, and just to you understand, we, we, you know, a lot of small companies think about growth in terms of AR growth or top line growth. One of the challenges we have in the broader analytics space is you have a lot of companies that raise the VC funding, play the roulette wheel, and just spend a lot of cash to do new customer acquisition without necessarily regard to the economics or building a long term sustainable business. We're really focused on a long term sustainable business, so we think about growth as a function of um, growth in ARR, as well as margin growth. So we're profitable today. We intend to continue to be profitable. Uh, and we're so we're focused on growing our ARR and our growth. And yeah. our, uh, keep it up. You know, the, you I, I the rule of 40, that kind of thing. Yeah, total. The rule of 40 makes sense, Stephen, and I get it. But the flip, I'm going to be counterintuitive for a second. I mean, the flip side of that is you look at Bezos at Amazon. I mean, he famously manages the negative 14%, right, EBITDA margin. There's a reason because there's a lot of these companies that you just, you gave an example that have raised capital. Yes, they're being more aggressive with CAC. Yes, they're doing that. But that's also because their economics related to net revenue expansion to churn are really healthy. And they know if they can spend more upfront, more than anybody else to get the customer, that it's going to make sense over the long term. So how do you compete with these folks that are willing to spend more than you to acquire the customer because they know their economics are healthy? Well, so, so, so I'll answer your question, but I'm going to argue with you on the first one. Look at Domo. Domo is a competitor in our space that raised, I think, $600 million, um, went public and is trading, at, last I checked, less than that. And they certainly went public for a net loss for their investors. So you look at companies like Burst that raised a ton of money and then ultimately imploded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you're citing product. two of the ones that didn't do so well, though. I mean, those mo- most it's the flip side. Uh, I would argue, I, I think if you go up and add it, you'd find that, that the ones you hear about are the ones that do really well and the ones that don't are the ones you don't hear about. Um, but, but let me answer your second question because we could get into that topic for a long time. Um, so how do we compete with them? We compete with them by being smart, knowing our use case. Our use case is to focus on product managers and application teams. And our focus and our win theme is around the ability to embed so deeply within their application that no one knows that it's us as part of their application. We want to deliver the best engaging product experience. And we're the only company of scale that focuses on that use case. Most of our competitors in the space go after direct use cases, go after wide industries. Um, They go after any kind of operational type improvement use case they can. We're the only ones out there that really focus in on the product managers and application teams and how do you embed it within an application. And that requires a different product stack, it requires a different licensing model, it requires a different go-to-market. Sure. And the, that's eff- how- the effect of this and that, just because most of the, these are words until you actually like figure out how to actually measure these things, right? So the measurements that would articulate, yes, what you just said is actually true and it's working is you look at churn and you say, is it really, really low? So you said 1,900 customers since 2010. You said earlier an average price point of call it 100 grand per year and you're doing about 30 million AR. That would put you at about 300 customers today. So what happened to 1,600 customers over the past 10 years? Well, so so keep in mind that, that is true if you had a SaaS model with reoccurring business. Again, remember, until two years ago, much of our business was perpetual. And so in perpetual, you're not necessarily getting that full recurring revenue, right? You're only going to get a percent of it. So when I talk to you about a typical ASP today, those are new business deals that we're doing, not deals that we did 10 years ago for 10,000, 15,000, whatever. Sorry, I, that, my active question customers. was just active today. Active customers active paying you customers. monthly today. Sure. It's about 1,000. Okay, but even that, if I multiply a thousand, if I multiply a thousand times that ACV you just gave me, that puts you way, that puts you at like 90, 90 million in ARR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, keep in mind, a lot of the people that we brought on in prior years brought in as perpetual, right? So when you sell a $100,000 deal on perpetual, you get a $20,000 maintenance stream. 
right? I, so, see, so, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Work that way into sort of a story. I mean, if I can tell you right now, if I was to look at our average ASP last quarter, it was about ninety thousand dollars. Yep. ACV. All right. But much of our customer base came in on a perpetual license model. And so many of those are on a maintenance stream type model. Which are much, much lower. Like call it 10, 20 grand, something like that. That's exactly right. That's 20% exactly right. of ACV. Yeah. That's right. And those that's, are like, a, that's like SLA related stuff. Sorry? That's like uptime related, SLA related stuff, maintenance contract, but that kind of stuff. Support, basically. Yeah. Call and log support tickets, that kind of thing. That's yeah. exactly right. So, yeah. so how but do you measure things like churn? Uh, so we measure churn in three ways. So first off, we measure churn as a percent of our total ARR base on both a number of customers as well as a dollar basis. Um, we measure churn on a net renewal rate, so including upsell. And then we measure churn or renewal rate on a standard renewal rate in terms of those up for renewal in a given year. Our renewal rate is about 90%. Okay, so it's about 90% and that's, and that's gross right. or net? That, that's, so, so, so net renewal, which includes upsell, is over 100%. How far? Uh, I can go back and look at the exact numbers. I, I, I can't recall off the top of my head, but it's 100 or 110, 120, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, but gross renewal, so renewal on the ARR base is 90%. Got it. So said differently, you correct me, if, Stephen, correct me if I'm wrong here, okay? So said differently, you're churning about 10% of your revenue each year. However, your expansion revenue is more than 20%. So net, net, you're at 110% plus. Good math. I mean, is that, is that, is that right. I, but that's I want to make sure that's right. accurate. Okay. Yeah, that is accurate. Yeah. Okay. So the people that are churning, are those typical old licenses that are, that are stopping their maintenance contracts or is it people that are on your SaaS model, but are maybe downgrading or seats or something? Yeah. So we measure that and we have a monthly meeting where we literally categorize why people churn. Um, roughly about 60% of our churn is the product is discontinued. Okay. So keep in mind, we, what we offer gets embedded in a product that they then go sell. Uh, and we work with a lot of companies that are 50 person companies, 100 person companies. Sometimes the product they sell gets discontinued or they no longer are in business. Um, and that's about 60 percent of our reasons for churn. The other 40 percent is they don't ever actually get into production. Um, and, and that's something we do a lot to try and help them get into production. Um, but the reality is, you know, sometimes priorities change at organizations. Sometimes people leave. Sometimes projects get killed. Um, and so those are the typical reasons. Interesting. Walk me through, let's go back to the top of the funnel. We were just kind of at the bottom. Let's go back to the top. Um, how aggressive are you being in terms of acquiring these customers? So when you look at your fully weighted CAC, right? And let's say your first year ACV, you said is about a hundred grand right now. What are you willing to spend to acquire that kind of account? Well, so we look at it in terms of payback. That's how we kind of think about it. Um, uh, you know, I, CAC and LTV, I, I've seen five different calculations and I've talked to multiple different investors on that. And we tend to find that metric is confusing and requires an allocation of marketing spend and all that sort of stuff that, that is subjective. So, so we look at it as how much do you spend in sales and marketing and how much ACV do we get and what's our kind of rate of return on that. Um, if I look on new ACV that we get versus ca versus how much we spend in sales and marketing, it's about a one-to-one -one ratio. Okay, so you're spending a dollar to get a new dollar of ARR. There. Steven, sorry, we cut out there for a second. Just to be clear, so you're spending about a dollar to get a new dollar of ARR. Um, one to that one. That is correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Correct. That's that's great. And when you when you are spending that money, so if you're spending a hundred thousand bucks to get a hundred thousand dollar ACV contract, where are you typically spending that? Is it is it mostly like an inside sales team or direct spend on Google? Where do you see it? Yeah, so it's a combination. So we have an inside sales team that's doing outbound outreach, things along those lines. We have a sales team that is doing. Um, that's what I'm looking for. Outbound. Uh, web marketing, outbound emails, <laughs> webinars, all that sort of fun stuff as well. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And then, um, and then walk us through, I mean, you mentioned lifetime value. Some people live and die by it. Some people ignore it because it doesn't help them drive the business at all. Do you use that at all? And if so, how do you use it? Um, so, so we look at it. Um, you know, I, th I think it's challenging because you have to build in assumptions around expansion and upsell and things along those lines. And the reality is our expansion and upsell um, has really taken off in the last year or two. Um, we started to introduce new modules and new capabilities, um, and that's given us an opportunity to go back to the customer base and add additional value. And so we're getting more of that. Um, so, so truthfully, we probably do need to go back and, and reassess our metrics and how we look at that. But you know, we haven't today. We, we again, look at it as how much are we spending in sales and marketing and what kind of ACV do we get as a result of that? Um, and, and that's typically how we look at it. Yeah. Last complicated question before we wrap up with some easy ones. When you look at bookings growth, like in a quarter, um, what, do you have a target for that? And, and if so, what is that target? Um, well, so, so we do have our targets, right? Um, and, and we have our targets in terms of ACV from new, ACV from expansion, all that sort of stuff. 
Um, you know, again, our plans are built around this growth plus margin concept. So of the 40? Up, I'm sorry? 40? Uh, no, this year will be high 20s. This high 20. High tw- yeah, this year will be high 20s. Next year will be in the 30s. Year before that, we were in the, the teens. And the year before that, we were negative. So we were on this kind of path to profitability, right? Um, and so we think about how are we going to grow our bookings, but we also think about it relative to how much we want to spend to grow our bookings. Yeah, yeah. Um, and both Steven, of those hold on. I, cu- I cut you off. I want you to go back to, I rudely cut you off. Tell us how you, some people don't know that rule yet. So tell tell everyone how you calculate it. Yeah, so, so we think about it as growth plus margin and growth is percent growth of ARR on an annual basis. And margin is EBITDA as a percent of revenue. Okay, so earnings before interest tax and depreciation. It's, it's, a, it's a measure of profitability, right? Um, and so you just add those two together from a nominal basis. And, and, and most studies will show that the most valuable companies um, have higher GPM. Right? Um, so we decided to go on this path about a year and a half ago when we had a negative GPM. And by the way, most of these hyper growth companies do have negative GPM um, and have steadily been growing that year over year. So this year, our targeted growth was in the teens on both ARR growth. And um, uh, and EBITDA growth, and we should end the year somewhere in the high twenties in terms of the combination thereof. Yep, guys, a good public example of this, if you want to dig in deeper, is like MuleSoft, for example. So in 2016, their you know unlevered free cash flow margin was like negative five percent, but their growth was 75 percent. So their rule of 40 would put them at about at about 70 when you're adding those two together. There's a lot of public companies though that actually fall below that. Uh, Cloudera, uh, sorry, uh, uh, a few companies fall below that, but that's the same rule that you're using even as a private you know pr- a private equity owned company. Company, correct. That's exactly. It's all about building the most valuable company we can. Yeah. And whether you're public or you're private, what we see is those companies get higher multiples. Yep. Now, when you look at your cash flow margin bottom line, are you including any the value of any stock you're issuing to incentivize no. employees? You don't include no. that. Okay. So that's no. some people do. Some a lot of investors I know actually do include that. They do consider that a hit on cash flow. You don't. No. No, okay. we do not. Interesting. No. no. It's the only thing that come out of that are any kind of tax liabilities. And, you know, we have a little bit of debt on our books. So yep. interest payment relative to debt. Yeah, which is expected if you were just bought by a private equity company. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> All right, Stephen, let's wrap up with a famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? A uh, book I'm reading and I use a lot right now is Blue Ocean Strategy. I think it's really, refl- and I, I have five copies of it on my bookshelf and I give it to employees all the time because I think it's very reflective of the market that we're in. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying right now? No. And I'll tell you why. You know, it's funny. You look at the, the celebrity CEOs and you look at the, the press out there. It feels a little bit like Us Weekly or People Magazine. Uh, and the reality is I don't care if Elon Musk is smoking pot on a, on a podcast show or whatever. Uh, I got Steven, things- Steven, sorry. The, the, the purpose of the question is to actually discover new people no one's talking about. Tell me one in uh-huh. someone in Northern Virginia that you just love getting lunch with that no one talks about. Uh, well, I don't know about Northern Virginia, but but Jerry Delinsky is one of the operating partners who's current CEO of Longview and is working with a number of Marlin operating partners. And he's someone I talk to every week uh, to get input on sales strategy, marketing strategy, new growth levers, that sort of thing. It's Jerry Delinsky. Jerry Delinsky. Very good. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building your business? Oh, favorite online tool for building our business. So, you know, I spend eight hours a day in Salesforce. I know that's a very straightforward answer, but but that, I live and die in that in that thing. It, my wife hates it. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? I get a solid eight. That's I, good. I'm not, I don't get my eight. And what's your situation? Obviously, well, you just mentioned wife. Any kiddos? Uh, yeah. So I'm married 15 years, just celebrated 15 years this year. Wow. And I have an 11-year-old boy and an eight-year-old daughter. Congratulations, Stephen. And how old are you today? 42. 42. Last question. Take us back to your 20 year old self. What do you wish he knew? What do I wish I knew? Uh, you know, it, it's funny. Um, 20 year old self, what do I wish I knew? Um, you know, I, I think planning really far ahead is, is valuable, but you can never get really more than one or two years out. Um, I think having a, a longer term goal is fine, but trying to plan out everything meticulously is just going to defeat the purpose. Plan in the first six, next six months really specifically. After six months to two years, make it a little more wide open and 10 years out, just have a high level goal. But don't try to get any more specific than that because life gets in the way. Guys, life gets in the way. Don't plan too far out ahead. Founded in 2003, really got things cranking in 2010 with his perpetual model and then selling uh, maintenance contracts on the back end. Just recently launched the SaaS model, passed 30 million bucks in ARR, raised about 50 million bucks up through 2016 before he sold to Marlin in 2017. Today, serving over a thousand active customers. And that's a blend between perpetual licenses on maintenance 
contracts and uh, new just p- kind of pure SaaS revenue. Uh, scaling nicely, economics healthy, net revenue retention 110%. Peel back that onion, there's gross revenue churn under that of about 90%. So expansion kicking in nicely. In terms of aggressiveness aggressiveness on customer acquisition, spending about a dollar uh, in to get a new dollar in ARR. Folks in Ukraine, the UK, NDC, 140 strong. Stephen, thanks for taking us to the top. Thanks, Nathan. Take care.